Now that we've introduced various measures of cost conceptually, let's think about what they look like when we put them on a graph. Starting with total cost, which we see here, we notice that we're going to be graphing cost with quantity of output on the x-axis, and in this case, just dollars on the y-axis. Because obviously total cost is some function of the quantity produced. And we'll note that this total cost graph has a number of features. The most obvious feature is that total cost is always increasing as quantity increases. That just reflects the fact that it costs more to produce more stuff. We can also notice that in this particular example, our curve is bowed up a little bit. That's not necessarily always the case, but it is pretty typical. Technically, we could have a total cost curve that's instead bowed downwards, or sometimes we'll see a total cost curve that's just linear, like this. But typically, we draw the total cost curve looking like this because it represents the concept of diminishing marginal product of our inputs, which is just the concept that each additional input is not as useful as the one that came before it. So we can say total cost pretty typically looks like this. Again, always increasing. You'll also notice that it doesn't start at a total cost of zero. And the reason for that is just that this initial point here at a quantity of zero just represents the fixed costs of production, which are present even if the production quantity is in fact zero. We can also think about how to graphically break down total cost into the components of fixed cost and variable costs. Like we said before, fixed costs are those costs that don't vary with the quantity of output, and variable costs, not surprisingly given the name, are costs that do vary with the quantity of output. And as you recall, the relationship is just total cost is equal to total fixed cost plus total variable cost. And we can see how this works graphically because our total fixed cost is just going to be a horizontal line. Because if our total fixed cost is constant regardless of the quantity produced, we're just going to be getting the same dollar value regardless of what quantity we're at. On the other hand, our total variable cost is upward sloping because our total variable cost gets bigger as we produce more output. You'll also notice that variable cost is by definition zero when our output quantity is zero. So the graph of our total variable cost is always going to start at this zero, zero point here. And you'll notice graphically that if we were to add together these two quantities, we would in fact get something that looks like what we drew for total cost over here. We can also think about how to represent and calculate average total cost by looking simply at our total cost graph here. You'll notice on the graph, what I did is I chose a particular quantity, Q1, that we want to calculate average total cost for. And I noted that point on our graph. So you see you have Q1 and then the total cost of producing quantity Q1. The next thing that I did in order to think about average total cost is I just drew a straight line from this point zero, zero here to our point in question on the total cost curve. You can ask yourself, well, why did I do this? As it turns out, my average total cost of producing this quantity is just the slope of this line between the origin and the point on the total cost curve. And we can see why that is here. So if you recall, the slope of a line is just rise over run, or alternatively, change in y over change in x. So in this example, our slope is just the total cost of producing q1 minus 0, because that's our change in y. And our change in x is just q1 minus 0. So what we see is that our slope is just total cost minus zero divided by quantity minus zero, 
which is in fact the total cost of producing Q1 units divided by quantity. And we said before that our average total cost was just total cost divided by quantity, so we get exactly the mathematical relationship we were looking for. And we can see that the slope of this line that we constructed here is in fact equal to the average total cost of producing this many units. We can even calculate marginal cost by looking at the total cost curve. You'll notice here, again, we have the same cost curve, but now rather than drawing a line from the origin to our point in question, I instead drew a line that's tangent to our cost curve at this point, quantity Q1. And again, drawing a line that's tangent just means that it intersects the curve at exactly this one point here. So it's just touching in that one point and we see that it looks something like this. As it turns out, the slope of this line here is equal to the marginal cost of producing this q one unit. And we can see why that is over here. So the slope of a line tangent to a curve, by definition, just using calculus that you probably don't have to know, but it's helpful to at least know a little bit about why this is, the slope of this tangent line is the derivative of the thing on the y-axis, which is total cost, divided by, or with respect to, the thing on the x-axis. So we see that the slope of this tangent line is just the derivative of total cost with respect to quantity. Roughly speaking, we can say that this derivative is equal to the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity for very small changes in quantity, which is in fact our definition of marginal cost. So what we see here is that when we have total cost as a function of our quantity, if we were to draw a tangent line at the point in question on our total cost curve, the slope of that tangent line would be equal to the marginal cost of this unit here. It's also pretty typical to see multiple cost curves on the same graph, usually those representing average fixed cost, average variable cost, average total cost, and marginal cost. For these cost curves, because they're all in terms of dollars per unit, it makes sense to think about a graph with, again, our quantity on the x-axis, but now rather than just dollars on the y-axis, now we specifically have dollars per unit on the y-axis. So if we were to think about, for example, average fixed cost, Average fixed cost is just total fixed cost divided by quantity. Total fixed cost is just a constant number. So our average fixed cost is going to be just some constant divided by quantity. So it's going to look something like this. The most important feature to note here is that average fixed cost is strictly decreasing as quantity increases. And that makes sense because as quantity increases, this constant total fixed cost is spread over more and more units. Marginal cost generally looks something like what we have here. In this case, the important feature of marginal cost is that at some point, marginal cost starts increasing as quantity produced increases. This increasing marginal cost just reflects, again, what's called diminishing returns of our different inputs to production. So, for example, as we're producing a higher quantity of output, this is requiring us to get, for example, more and more workers. And it's usually the case that the second worker is not as useful as the first worker, the third worker is not as useful as the second worker, and so on and so forth. So if each additional worker is less productive than the one before, each additional unit on the margin is eventually going to be more expensive to produce than the one that came before. So even though sometimes we might have a marginal cost curve that is initially decreasing here, we usually get to a point where we see an increasing marginal cost. 
One exception to that is when we're talking about the concept of natural monopoly. And natural monopolies are unique in that their marginal cost, it doesn't specifically have to be flat as I've drawn it here, but it doesn't have the feature of it eventually increasing. So we can think about this being a particular special case, and in the vast majority of cases, we're instead going to see marginal costs that look like this. We can also look at average total cost or average cost on this set of graphs as well. Here, average total cost has two notable features that we want to keep in mind. The first is that average total cost generally exhibits this sort of U shape that we see here. The second point is that this intersection of marginal cost and average total cost right here is actually at the bottom of the average total cost U. In other words, this intersection point between marginal cost and average total cost is at the minimum of average total cost. So let's think a little bit about why that is. In order to understand the relationship between marginal cost and average cost, it's helpful to think about an analogy involving maybe your exam grades over the course of the semester. So let's say hypothetically that your current exam average is an 80%. It's pretty clear then if you got something higher than 80% on your next exam, say you got an 85 on your next exam, that's going to pull your average up. On the other hand, if you were to get something lower than an 80% on your next exam, say you got a 70, that would drag your average down. So what we'll notice is that basically the score on your next exam is your marginal score and your overall exam average is obviously your average score. So if you were to do better on your next exam than your current average, in other words if your marginal exam score was higher than your average exam score, your average score would be increasing. On the other hand, if your marginal exam score was less than your current average, your average would be pulled down or your average would be decreasing. We see the same relationship between marginal cost and average cost. Namely, that when marginal cost or the cost to produce that last unit is less than your current average total cost, you're pulling average total cost down, or average total cost is decreasing. When the marginal cost, or the cost of that next unit, is greater than your current average cost, well, that's pulling your average total cost up, or it's making your average total cost increasing. And we can see what this means on the graph here, that whenever we have marginal cost, which is this guy here, below average total cost, which is this here, our average total cost is decreasing. As soon as this flips over, and then we have our marginal cost up here, and our average cost down here, or marginal cost is greater than average total cost, what we see is that average total cost, as we said, is increasing. So this flip from decreasing to increasing is what gives us the U-shape for average total cost, and it's also what tells us that this intersection point has to be at the bottom of the U. Because this is exactly the point at which we've decreased, 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 and now we're switching over to increasing. So this just by definition has to be at the bottom. It's also worth noting that the quantity that minimizes average total cost is called the efficient scale of production. So here we could say that this Q here that corresponds to the bottom of our average total cost is equal to the efficient scale for this particular company or production process. 
Again, our natural monopoly is a bit of an exception to this rule in that if we were to look at average total costs for a natural monopoly, we don't get the typical U-shape that we talked about here. Instead, we get something that is continuously downward sloping. And the reason for this is because the feature of a natural monopoly that enables this is that our marginal cost is always less than our average total cost. So as long as this is always the case, we're going to be in a situation where our average total cost is always decreasing. And we're never going to flip over to a situation where our total cost is increasing. So basically, we only get the left-hand side of this U. And we get a continuously decreasing average cost. It's important to remember that, again, natural monopolies are pretty rare. And in most cases, you are going to see a normally behaved average total cost curve that looks like this here. The last curve we can look at on this graph is average variable costs. Now you'll notice that, like average total cost, average variable cost typically has this U shape here, largely for the same reason as we just explained with average total cost. And again, like average total cost, the intersection of average variable cost and marginal cost is also at the bottom of this U shape for average variable cost. The other thing to note about average variable cost is that as we get to higher and higher levels of production or quantity, you'll notice that average total cost and average variable cost get closer and closer together. So here, average total cost and average variable cost are pretty far apart. But as we increase our quantity, that gap is narrowing and narrowing. And the reason for this is simply the fact that average total cost is equal to average variable cost plus average fixed cost. And like we said earlier, our average fixed cost is getting closer and closer to zero as our quantity increases which would imply that these average total costs and average variable costs are coming together as quantity increases. In addition, like with average total cost, our natural monopoly is an exception to the rule where the average variable cost doesn't show this shape. But again, for most firms, this is a reasonable approximation to what our average variable cost looks like.